But welcome again. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we're going to talk, I guess, in about kind of an informal discussion, information put together by uh, a number of members of the Alliance of Angels, and happy to share um, kind of some of my thoughts and experience from a journey along the way as well. So let me let me share some slides. And please confirm everyone can see my slides. Can anyone let me know just to? Yes. Okay, we're good. All right, thank you. Uh, so let's talk about the Alliance of Angels to begin with. Um, it's a great group, by the way. As a former founder, uh, they actually invest in the company I was a part of. It's a very very thoughtful group, but some of the facts and figures, it's a group of 150 angel investors in the Seattle area, actually Pacific Northwest. We've got some in Oregon as well. Uh, they invest about $10 million in 20 regional companies. Uh, could I ask everyone to please mute if you haven't muted. We still have some background notes coming through. Thank you. So they invest about $10 million in 20 regional companies per year. Uh, they've had over 40 exits, uh, estimated 20% internal rate of return, which is pretty impressive. They're sector agnostic, and they've totaled over $100 million in money invested, and they've got over 100 active portfolio companies. It's a nonprofit member organization founded in 1997. It's been around for a long time. And you'll recognize some of the, the, the names that are on here. Clarisonic, DocuSign was a, was a huge outcome. Uh, Julep is an interesting company. <clears throat> uh, we got some pharmaceuticals, uh, Record 360, Stabilitas, Snap-in, Lean Plum, <clears throat> and then many, 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 many more. Uh, just a little bit, <clears throat> my background, um, electrical engineer, computer science, uh, technical sales, Fortune 500, three startups. Part of a number of exits, uh, was a founder of a company that had an exit, was invested by Alliance of Angels, and now been Alliance of Angels for a long, long time. And it's a great organization. Uh, a lot of experienced people who can help you assess and evaluate investments. And in, uh, you've got domain experts, you've got functional experts, and people work together uh, to evaluate investments in different companies. So let's talk a little bit about angel investing. I mean, what, what is it? Why do people do it? What's good about it? What, what should you be careful of? So it's, it's equity or convertible debt investments made by individuals in early stage private companies that have high growth potential. So they're usually uh, pre-revenue or early revenue. The nice thing is you get in on the ground floor, you know, for example, you know, one of the great stories, you know, would be Amazon. Amazon, if you invested 25000 early, you know, it had hung on to it long term, could be worth close to a billion dollars. So that's that's the extreme potential that's out there. We'll go through some, some of the statistics. The reality is, um, you know, the majority fail to return the money that's invested, but those that are successful do extremely well. So that's why it's important to have a portfolio and eyes wide open that it's that it's risky. So the industry, they, about $20 billion per year gets invested in angel investing. Uh, 60,000 companies per year take on angel investment. And the median deal size uh, for the entrepreneur is about $700,000 for their company. So you invest your own money, typically into local companies. Usually it's line of sight, uh, you know, where people can see each other. Um, 25,000 to 100,000 per investment on average. Uh, I will say sometimes it can be as low as, as 10, but 25,000 is probably the most common number and you know kind of super angels will invest a hundred thousand dollars so who makes who's what's a typical angel investor look like so you've got to have high risk tolerance um because if you've got a port we'll go through this if you've got a portfolio of 20 companies um you know half will fail to return the money that's invested and the goal is that a, a few will will give high returns and in, in, in the statistics show that out uh, hands-on approach to investing. So this isn't an ETF. This is not a mutual fund. 
this is an investor, it's a person, it's a team that you'll probably get a chance to meet in person. You'll get regular email updates from them. So it, it tends to be pretty personal as opposed to you know, large companies that are, that are pretty distant and, and hard to access. And it's patient. You know, often it can take uh, you know, five to 10 years. Uh, you know, some of the biggest exits, you, know, you, can, you can take a look at DocuSign, um, you know, took more than 10 years to get a return. Now the return was fantastic. You know, it was a you know, multiple billion dollar exit. So it was a great return for the investors, but it's not liquid. You can't, you can't go spend it. So um, you just need to be eyes wide open that uh, even though the gains over time tend to look pretty good, they're, they're often gains on paper for a period of time. Many angel investors are former entrepreneurs themselves who've had some success and like to stay in the game and stay close to it. Right, now I'm like many in the in Pacific Northwest in particular are corporate execs from tech, life sciences, and other industries. So, you know, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, all familiar names, as well as uh, some of the pharmaceuticals. Uh, one of the things I think that's important is you got motives beyond making money, right? There, there are uh, lots of investments. If you've got money that, that you can make, you've got the, you've got the public markets, uh, you've got a lot of different, uh, you know, private funds, you've got distressed debt funds. There, there are things that you can do. Again, it tends to be pretty impersonal. You've got investment professionals who will go out and make that. But what's nice about an angel investment is you can provide support to a new business and idea. So you're, you're kind of giving back. Uh, it's exciting. It's personal. And you feel like you're making a difference. Uh, and you are. You're making a difference in, in someone's life. Often you'll, you'll leverage prior relationships uh, and experience. So it might be people that you know. Uh, you can leverage or relationships that you've got that can help entrepreneurs. So you may have access to people in the domain where they work. You may have functional expertise, whether it's financial, whether it's product, whether it's sales and marketing. So you can actually influence the outcome of that investment by, by helping them directly. And you can enable advancement in fields that are important to, to him or her kind of on the ground floor and, and um, help it progress. So I've got two slides of data. This is kind of a historic slide. This is from 10 years ago, some significant studies that were done that show on average, you know, in a 20 to 30% internal rate of return on average overall. And there are several thousand companies that were covered in here. A uh, more recent study that was done, you know, tracking angel returns by uh, Robert Wilkbank uh, shows overall average of money invested multiple of 2.5, and a gross internal gross IRR of 22%. And I'm hoping people know what IRR is. If they don't, you know, feel free. You can look it up in Investopedia, but it's it's basically the average annual return of the money. So it's 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 compounding. But if you break it down a little bit more, what you'll see is you know 70% returned less than one X of your money. So you know if you if you made 10 bets, uh, seven of those are going to return less than what you put in. Uh, and some of those will probably be zero. You've got just less than 20% provide a return of, of between one and five X. You've got about 5% that provide a five to 10 multiple. You've got two or 3% that 10 to 30 X. And then you've got, um, you've got about one to 2% that really make the fun, right? That return over a 30 X. And, and this, is, this is what it looks like. So if you make a single, I've got a friend who I told him this, I said, you can't just make a single angel investment because if you do, it will probably fail just statistically. Of course, he recently told me that he made one investment and I think it's worth 39 times what he, he put in. So there, there are cases where that's not true, but I, I would argue statistically that, that he got lucky. But if you do make enough, and some of the studies I've read show that the single, single biggest predictor on, on the gross IRR of a person's investments are the number of investments that they make. And, and part of that is you just don't wanna miss out on, on the big wins. So the broader you invest, the more likely you'll get the big ones because the big ones far outweigh um, those, those that lose. And you'll see on the right, there's, there's more data in there. We can share these slides later that show um, of the different uh, studies that were done. 
what the returns look like. And you can see it's pretty similar, you know, 50 to 55 to 70% in the less than one X return uh, is about 35, 35 and, and 20. So you can see it's pretty similar. If you look down on the bottom, so the average outcome is two and a half times the money put in as a group. Uh, average hold time was four and a half years. So it was illiquid for four and a half years. Internal rate returned 22% and 70% that um, returned less than, than 1x. Um, so where does it fit in on the spectrum of investments that you could make? So obviously cash, the, the return is low, although it, you argue it's getting better lately, but there's no upside. Fixed income, you get a little bit of a return, but there's, there's minimal upside. Uh, real estate, pretty good investment. Um, not, not very exciting, but it's, it's pretty stable over time, pretty decent return. Uh, public equities historically have done well. They've not done well this year, but, but overall, public equities have been a pretty good place to be for the long run. And then private equity has outperformed public, public particularly over the last 20 years. And so angel investing is a subset of private equity. So you've got venture capital, you've got uh, what we call like PE firms. And then angel, which is kind of the earliest stage of that private equity. So I'll say it again. I think it's important if people haven't done this. You know, general outcome expectations through group angel investing. You know, they highly concentrated returns. So ten percent of your investments will produce eighty to ninety percent of of the cash returns. It's very risky. You know, any one investment, the most likely outcome is a loss of capital. It's illiquid. So you know, more than a four year minimum hold, and you know, the reality is the, the, the biggest wins are often seven to 10 to, you know, you can say 12 years, but, but the, the, the good news is those are often extremely large. Overall return expectation, if one persists, very attractive, 2.2 to 2.6 times capital. So, all right, so it's risky, but the returns can be high. And if you've got a large group, uh, the average return can be pretty substantial. So how's it different than public equities? Well, you've got more control and direct influence over the company. Uh, you can get involved in boards, whether as a board advisor, actually as a board member, you can get involved in advisory roles. Um, I've done all of those things. I can tell you it's very rewarding. You get a, um, a ground view level of, of how things are operating and you have a chance to influence it and help people out. Often you'll have preferred shares with additional rights as well. So that you've, you've got a, so even though you invest, um, Typically, you'll invest ahead of common shares, which is what the founder and employees have. So you're the first money back out when it's sold. So less, liqui less liquidity. You know, there's a limited, you almost have to assume there's no marketplace for it. And I guess in, it, there is a, a market for it. Um, not something I'm super uh, familiar with. It is possible to sell some things in the private market, but it's very, very difficult. So you assume that you can't sell it in a longer time horizon, typically five to 10 years. So angel investing versus venture capital. We all hear about the VCs. Uh, earlier stage companies, typically with little or no revenue uh, on a product prototype. So you want to be uh, very, very careful about your belief in the market. Is the market big enough? Is, does the product look like something would fit within the market? Do you like the team? Do you believe in the team? Uh, you know, do they have the grit? Do they have the experience? Um, and knowledge and, and drive to make it happen because it's it's hard it's hard to make a comp it's hard to start up a company it's it's very very exciting but it's 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 extremely hard. The round sizes tend to be smaller, so five hundred thousand to you know one point five million, and the valuations tend to be lower, so you know in the three to eight million range, and it's varied a lot, right? I mean, five years ago rounds were three four five million, a year ago rounds were six, eight, 10 million. Um, I think the, the valuation, sorry, I'm saying rounds, the valuations I think today um, are probably, have probably backed off a little bit. The nice thing about that, you know, it's, it's the math isn't that simple, but you know, if you invest at, even call it 10 million, you know, if the company sells for a billion, you know, it's not quite a hundred X return because you've got dilution in there and other things, but it's, it's, it's a big return. Uh, the other thing, you know, it's not dependent on unicorn hunting, you know, to make the fund because even smaller exits can deliver solid returns. So that's 
One thing I think, you know, VCs require a home run, right? They need one company to have a hundred, 100 to 200 X return. Not true for an angel investor. Um, um, you know, every, every angel investor has different uh, goals, but you know, if you get a two to three X return on your money in five years, that's a great return. That'll put a smile on, um, I think almost every angel investor I can think of. So you where honestly with a VC, that's a disappointment, you know, a two to three X return. They, they doesn't help their fund. They, they really need them to perform um, more highly. So there's more pressure to perform. Will they be, uh, will she need to take her? Um... We've got a, sorry, could you, someone's asking a question, but I don't think it's to the group. Could you please mute? Um, so angel investing versus Las Vegas. Um, I'm a big believer in this. I've got a little bit of a mathematical mind and, and ultimately, you know, in Vegas, the odds are stacked against you. The, the reason they're giving out free drinks and um, they've got beautiful buildings and people make hundreds of millions of dollars in the background is because statistically you're going to lose money over time. Where statistically with angel investing, you'll make money and, and, and you'll make a lot. Doesn't mean you always will, but at least statistically, it, um, it's, it's headed that direction. The nice thing is professionalism of angel investing over the last five to 10 years has led to improved processes and standardized deal structures. So uh, they've got these things called safe notes, which is alone, which is very, very standardized. So you're not creating, not typically creating unique deal terms and, and the founder's not wasting valuable money generating those, those uh, special yeah. contracts as well. So the Angel Capital Association, Angel Resource Institute, uh, a lot of it has become more and more standardized. You can really just focus on on the company, the team, and the hey, opportunity at stake. She's been trying to reach me. And she has some concerns about my insurance. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to mute. Again, just ask everyone, please mute just for everyone else's uh, sanity. So what's the process look like? So highly suggest you join an angel group. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of AOA, but even if you join another group, it's, it's really, really smart because you'll, you'll spend time, you'll rub elbows with people who have been angel, done angel investing often for uh, you know, 10 to 20 years. So they've got a lot of expertise in our experience and what works well. And sometimes more importantly, you know, scars from what to avoid. So get involved with an angel group. A uh, couple of things that they'll do is they'll, they'll generate deal flow. It's our second point on here uh, for you. And they'll tee it up, they'll screen them. And so you've got kind of a curated deal flow brought to you on a monthly basis. So you, you show up, you get a nice lunch and you have a chance to meet the entrepreneurs, uh, listen to their pitch, which has also been screened. So you don't have to sit through an hour of someone rambling. Um, it's very efficient. And then the follow-up with the group you can compare notes with, with other smart people. You can give your opinion as well to decide individually whether or not you think it's a, uh, a worthwhile investment. So deal screening and due diligence, a lot of work gets done to, to find out if, if um, you know, do you agree with what, what the entrepreneur believes pretty strongly in. And again, mentioned you can serve as a board director, advisor, coach, mentor. Uh, you could also get involved with securing additional you know, follow-on Financing, you know, Angel gets in early. You know, later typically they'll they'll uh, either do some loans, some some SaaS financing, or they might do a Series A or a Series B. And there's things you can help with as well. And then guides towards a liquidity event. And when companies get acquired or when they go public, I can tell you that if you've been a part of that company early on, and I've got I know I've known some entrepreneurs that were at the at the napkin stage with an idea. Maybe they had a co-founder, maybe they didn't. Um, 11, 12 years ago, uh, they're, they're now publicly traded, multi-billion dollar companies. Uh, a lot of pride goes along with that, having known them and been a part of their journey uh, back in the early days. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. So angel investment goals get equity. So successful angel investors purchase a share of the company uh, at a fair valuation, sell the equity later on, liquidity event for a large gain. That's the goal, again statistically usually doesn't work that way, but when it does, it feels good. Preferred equity is shares in a priced financing round. So there's pre-seed, seed, series A, et cetera. Uh, convertible debt. So those are our notes. So it's not a priced round. You're not actually getting equity. 
but you're getting a note that will convert to um, equity and at a, a certain price or not to exceed a certain price is typically how they're structured. So valuation, and there's a lot of discussion around valuation. Sometimes there's negotiation around valuation as well. Uh, but it really determines what percentage of the company that you're you're buying into. So it's a snapshot in time. It's what it's worth today. It's not what it's worth, you know, in the future. You don't know what it'll be worth in the future. But it, it they'll talk about pre-money valuation. So you know, company's worth five million. They raise a million. It's worth six million after. So you're valued on the pre-money. So that's the five million. Uh, or they'll have a cap. So they're going to raise it. You know, it, so if they're raising it with a cap of five million. And if their next price round is at four million, you know you'll get that four million plus a discount. If the next round is at ten million, yours will convert at at the five million. So they're all a little bit different. You want to pay close attention to the documents um, when it happens, and talk to people who are knowledgeable. This is all new to you, otherwise it may sound like Greek, but um, but that's kind of at a high level how it works. So you know. Who can invest? We'll talk about what an accredited, accredited investor is, but this is one example that this is not what you should do, but this is an example of, of what's generally suggested is that, you know, it, it should be, I've heard 5%, it could be as much as 10%, but it should be, it should be single digit amount of your liquid net worth because it is risky and it's not liquid. So figure out what that number is, you know, 5% of your liquid net worth. Uh, you want to invest in a minimum of 10 portfolio companies. Uh, 20 would be ideal, and that's in the additional round. And then as the companies raise money, if you like the progress that they've made, it's nice to have some money left for, for follow-ons as well. So, you know, this example, if you made $25,000 investments in 10 companies, that's $250,000. If you reserve 50% capital for follow-ons, that would be another $500,000. Um, that would be that would be quite a bit, um, but but yeah, that's that's the generally accepted advice. I think it's also reasonable if you just make the initial investment as well, if you don't uh, reserve money for the follow-on, I think. Uh, but I, I think proliferation is is the key. So trends observed from angel diligence investing can sometimes inform investments and other asset classes, um, particularly public equities. So we'll talk a little bit more about it. So 10 investments, um, you know, and again, the studies, you know, thousands and thousands of, of investments show this and the, and the invest, they've looked at portfolios of individual investors as well, that typically they make 10, the goal is to get one home run. So more than 10 X return, two, five X's, um, three singles, and then you get four zeros where it literally goes to zero. And that gives you your 20% IRR you know, if it lasts five years. So you've got to have the stomach for that. The other thing I'll throw in there is successful companies take time. Failures tend to come early. So one of the, the, the gut punches about investing early is um, you could be a year or two years in after making your investments and all you see are failures because companies aren't successful. Early stage companies aren't successful in a year or two years. They can be, but they're usually not. So it, it takes a little bit of stomach to, to ride out the first two to three years where you may have those four zeros and you're thinking, I made all mistakes. And then your singles and five X's and home runs may roll in over the next, the next five years. So why do angel investing? You know, it, it really is, it's partially to make money, but you know, almost by definition, um, you have to have money to invest in it. So um, it, it probably won't fundamentally change your financial picture, even if you're successful. Uh, but, but the goal is about making money. Um, I would argue many people I know it's about, it's about winning. Um, you know, so yeah, it's, it, but you know, making money is kind of how you keep score, but you want to pick the winners because it's fun to be a part of a winner. Um, and it's, it's fun, you know, much like sports, travel, arts, food, and wine, it's, it's fun to be involved. It's fun to see their successes. Um, even the struggles that they go through, you know, being a part of that journey is, is kind of a nice way to go through life rather than just some big anonymous, you know, Acme Corp company that you've invested in. Um, and it's a chance to, to give back. You can change the world. You can, you can invest in companies that 
can change the world. So whether it's climate change, whether it's um, you know pharmaceuticals, whether it's a particular industry that you grew up in and someone identified a problem and has a solution to eliminate that, you you can change people's lives and 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 have an effect on on the world uh, with your money by actively investing in early stage companies that can actually have a big big effect on that. So it's kind of the intersection of all three of those is really why people do angel investing. So I pulled this out. So, you know, it's defined by the Securities Act. You know, you need to be an accredited investor in order to invest. So net worth of at least a million dollars. So excluding the primary residence, income of at least 200,000 in the past two years. So you give me one of these criteria, the reasonable expectation to make it, you know, or $300,000 joint income. So, so you need to have money to, to invest. And I, I think most angel investors, because it's risky, um, are, are on the higher side of this. Okay, so kind of a high level overview, a uh, little bit of insight. Why don't I open it up to questions? Or thoughts or comments? Hi there, this is Tom Davis. Um, how long do you think you, you gave a great example of the sort of portfolio of 10, um, which is something I've heard several times? Um, how long do you think it takes to build that portfolio? Is it something that you take you sort of you would and recommend, especially for someone who's never done this before? Is it something that takes years or do you get it done done and dusted in the first 24 months and off you go and, and, and sit and wait? <laughs> <laughs> What's your suggestion on that? That's a really good question. And I, I, it's probably different for different people. I think it's about finding the right company, finding the right entrepreneurs, the right team that, that, that you want to get behind. Um, and I think it's important. I think, and I'll go from my own experience. I know that it, I tend to fall in love with companies. They have an idea. It's well thought through. And I just think this is great. And I, so it's helpful for me to be a part of an organization where some people may say, hey, I was part of that industry. Here's why. Here's why it's a great idea. Here's here's why it's a bad idea. Um, but to take the time to do the diligence, um, you want to do that with each one of those. I, I, I think it, it it will probably take years to get ten companies. I would be surprised. You could, if this was all you were going to do, if your full time effort was in finding companies, sourcing deals, evaluating them, and investing, you could probably do it in in one to two years. But that that would be pretty aggressive. Um, so I think a lot of it just depends on the time that you've got for it. I will tell you, you know, AOA is an example. Um, you know, they'll bring in, you know, three, four, five uh, entrepreneurs. Sometimes previous companies will give updates as well. And you'll have access to them on a monthly basis. I think they have 10 meetings a year. So that way to expose you. And, they'll, and they've got a funnel. I don't know what the percentage is, but um, I think I, I'll call it 20% of the companies that apply get in. So you've got companies that have made it through that first filter. And you'll see, you know, call it five per month. So you'll see 50 per year. So if you saw those 50 and you liked um, one in 10, you could do five a year. You could do it in two years. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking on the cuff here, but I mm -hmm. think a couple of years is probably reasonable. And I think a lot of people probably take more time and it probably takes three or four years to get to 10. And honestly, I think what happens, most people don't really have a fund. They tend to invest in one or two companies per year. You know, some there are super angels out there. They'll do ten companies a year, right? They've got uh, a big purse that they draw from, and and I know some people. And so you've got a almost like a series. If you're doing one or two per year, ten years from now you'll have you'll have ten to twenty, and ten years later you'll invest another ten or twenty. So people don't usually do ten and then sit around and wait to see what happens. Once it gets in your blood, it's kind of addicting, and it's it's fun to have a portfolio. And then, I mean, one of the things I do is. Angel companies, when they kick out money, because I started doing this 12 years ago, when they have an exit or liquidity, I've got a, an account that that money goes into, and I use that to fund new investments. And because, as you can see, um, they've done well, um, you know, a, I know some people have over 30% internal rates of return, that, that pot could start to get pretty big if you pour money back into it. But, but I don't want to talk people into it. That's the last thing I want to do. But it, um, to answer your, short, your question, probably a couple of years, but it tends to be ongoing. Hello, we might uh, give a plug for uh, uh, funds too. So um, in the uh, Alliance of Angels, we do have a, an innovation fund that started this past year. 
where you can uh, invest in the fund itself uh, for a minimum of 25,000. And then the pooled resources of the fund will then uh, select 10 or so companies over the following years. And there's a plan then to also refresh with uh, uh, a second fund uh, next year. So uh, for starting out angels, it's a, it's a good way to get your diversification without having to, you know, do 25,000 per deal and so forth. That's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Brent. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Anyone else? There are no stupid questions, so feel free to ask anything. I have a question. Yeah. Do most people, um, when they engage in angel investing, do so out of their personal SSN, or do they? Is it is it better advice to set up a separate LLC through which you're making your investments? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer that. Um, I I know I've gotten some personal advice on that that has been different from different sources. So it's a good question. Let me let me I, I if you've got an attorney or accountant, that's probably the right person to ask that to. There there is a level of of um, unless anyone else wants to jump on and and, and do their thoughts are, um, but. There is another level of protection, as I understand it, from doing it through an LLC. Right. Yeah, depending on who you talk to, there are pros and cons for each, for sure. Yeah. From a tax and from a tax and legal perspective. Right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I just didn't know if there was like a best practice. Um, I don't know. Let me find out. I'll see if the AOA has a stance on it. I know I personally have had, I've had professional advisors advise me to do it. And another to tell me to not do it. That so, you know, I I think it depends on who you talk to. It might just depend on your own personal situation too. Hey, Lowell, there's a couple uh, questions on the chat. Uh, normally, uh, how much time do angels spend with the founder before deciding to invest or not invest? And then, kind of a follow on that is. Uh, uh, sense of the engagement that happened between the angels and founders. Okay, good question. Thank you. I missed it on the chat. Um, so, really good question. So, it, it's um, again one of the nice things as an individual investor. You know, entrepreneurs are busy. They're trying to run a business. They're trying to raise money. Uh, they'll give limited time. Uh, you know, kind of to individuals. I guess it just depends on the situation. But AOA actually has a structured process. Once a company is up and you raise your hand that you're interested, uh, they'll actually do structured follow up with the groups that are interested. So, I guess in person time. Um, and Brent, maybe you have an opinion on this as well. I mean, it's it can be anywhere from you know the initial meeting where they'll see them present. They may talk to them after the presentation. It, it, so it might be an hour or two and then they may go to some of the follow-up sessions. So, you know, in the end they could end up spending, you know, two, three, four sessions with the person of an hour to two hours each time. Uh, th but the other nice thing is, is part of the due diligence, you'll have uh, experts that will do due diligence on a company in different, different facets and they'll make that information available. And we've also got tools um, that allow the sharing of information. So you can, you can go through their, their investor deck. You can look at their financials, you know, in one organized place for multiple potential companies you're looking at investing in. Uh, that platform makes it easier to access all that information. So it's, it's not just the time, but the information. And it can also facilitate uh, asking questions with them as well. And the second question, uh, sense of engagements that happen between angels and founders. Um, so I'm not sure I, do you know what, um, maybe you could expand on that a little bit. You mean as far as like interaction? Hi, yeah, this is Sayed. Yes, I meant, uh, you know, the engagement mean, what kind of engagements are these? These are formal engagement where founders and angels meet together and they look at some of the documents together or what kind of engagements are these? How do angels decide after? Because I, I see from your presentation that there's also a sense of, you know, sort of sense of belief in the entrepreneur and what they are doing and what change they want to 
bring, not just the financial return as far as the angels are concerned. So how do they get that part clear? Not just the business model, but also what change are they trying to bring in and what kind of team are they? What have they yeah. done in the past? How does that come into the picture for angels? Thank you. Yeah, you know, again, um, you know, as a part of AOA, they've, they've got like, you know, structured sessions uh, with a group of people that are interested in the company and with the founder or the founding team where they'll get together and and talk through different things. And, and and then it's also possible, you know, to meet them for coffee as well. You know, so if you want to get to feel for them and, and you know, potentially visit their office and, and, and see the team. Um, but, you know, if you're on your own as an individual investor, you can do that, particularly if you write bigger checks, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll take the time uh, to meet with you individually, but but like I say, with AOA, they'll actually structure meetings um, where you just have to show up by Zoom or in person, and they'll and they'll talk through product. They'll they'll have Q and A. They can talk through the tech stack if you want to. They can talk about their experience. So they're so you can get kind of not only the quantitative information that they've got on the business and and their plans, but kind of the qualitative side as well. You can kind of feel for the person. How well do they answer questions? How are they on their feet? You know, how well do they really know things? It's very different. I mean, meeting people in person, you, you get a very different sense than, than, you know, like we are right now on Zoom. It's just harder to get to know people and trust them that they're going to do the right thing, going to make good decisions. You know, do they have a good track record of success? Or, um, yeah. So most of it is structured within AOA, but there, there can be some kind of standalone side meetings. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, another question, do you provide introductions of founders to angel investors? If so, do you have expertise in life science companies? So uh, uh, the AOA does. So the, the format for the AOA is they'll, um, you apply. I know this having been on both sides. So you 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 apply, you get referred. Um, Eugene is the, is the primary point person and his email is actually up on the screen. And then he will screen kind of your, you'll have a conversation and, and companies see if it's a right fit. You know, is it based in the Pacific Northwest? Does it hit a lot of their metrics? Uh, they've got a screening committee that will will take a look at that. And then they'll coach you. You've got a, a very finite amount of time. One of the things I found as a as an entrepreneur was it forced me to get my pitch down to, I think it was 10 minutes. And I used to have a 30 minute pitch. So it forced you to, to, to get better at your pitch, which really values your time if you're looking at investing in companies because you get the best, you know, the classic, Apologize for the length of my letter. Didn't have time to write a short one. They're going to force you to write the short one, uh, so you don't waste other people's time. And uh, so that's if you make it through that cut, then you'll be on the monthly meeting, and you'll be put in front of uh, you know there's a group of 150 investors. I mean, not all show up at every meeting, but you know, 10 times a year. So yes, I'm a long answer to your question, but AOA facilitates the opportunity for entrepreneurs to be put in front of qualified investors who are actively looking to make investments and they do have experience in life sciences. Mm. Um, okay, for my company next year. Sorry, I'm just gonna read this to myself. I think that to depend on the investor to be from. Oh, come back to us in 15 years. Sure, it puts, you anyway, puts me to have a few great investors who would then look to sign up as an advisor for post-investor activity. Um, okay. The answer depends on the investor and the founder it has to be a good fit. I think that's a, that's a uh, it does have to be a good fit because I will tell you, having been an entrepreneur as well, um, you, you, your investors are there for the duration, right? They're not going to go away. So you want to have good investors, investors that, you know, they, they, the comment that everyone's money is green, but you want an investor that can ideally, I mean, one, as a minimum, you need the money, but I, one, you'd love to not have them be a negative influence, right? And, um, you know, and ideally have something they can bring to the party, right? Whether it's connections, right? Relationships, that can help business, with, with business development, or you could bring in talent, um, or just coaching or advice. Um, often, just someone that they can they can talk to. Uh, maybe someone that's been down that path before. There are a lot of different life skills that we all pick up along the way, and and again, scars from the failures uh, can be helpful 
to help others avoid that. And then the success that we've had, you can share those experiences with others uh, so that they don't have to learn those same lessons can be super valuable over and above just the check itself. Okay, another question I see in the chat, how often do founders come back to ask for subsequent funding? Uh, I know it varies, but is there a typical norm? Oh boy, um, I don't have any data on that. I think, <laughs> I would say they usually come back. I would, I, here would be my first thought, I'm just thinking out loud, is that they would probably almost always come back for more money. Whether the, if the business is doing well, they're gonna want more money to scale it. If the business is struggling, they're gonna want more money uh, to stay afloat. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, Amazon, ironically, was one of the companies that actually didn't raise a lot of money because they grew so quickly, um, as I understand it, that they, they, they didn't take on a lot of angel money. So if you, if you, companies need money to grow uh, and you either need to raise money by selling equity in the company, or you need revenue from your clients uh, and a prof profitable revenue from clients to, to fund new activity. So you, you need to get it one way or both, and typically both. The more revenue you have from clients, the easier it is to raise money. And then that's where you get the hockey stick growth. All right, good questions. Um, any other uh, thoughts or questions? Or comments? If anyone wants to comment on the questions, feel free as well. Okay. Um, well, if not, I'll wrap it up. But uh, but thanks for joining, everyone. Uh, have a great weekend. If you have questions, uh, the emails are on here. Feel free to uh, to shoot us an email. But uh, would love love to chat more if it's helpful. Thanks so much.